Carry Me Home, Diane McWhorter's Civil Rights History of Birmingham, is an unusual book because Birmingham is an unusual city. It's a new south town forged in the iron furnaces, and the struggle between labor and management, McWhorter explains, evolved into the struggle for civil rights. I spoke to her at the Alabama Writers Symposium at Alabama Southern Community College in Monroeville, Alabama. Well, thank you for coming in and congratulations. Thank you, thank you. This is a, a, a big, well, it's not been 10 days, has it? Just, it's just been a few days since it was announced that you got the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, April 8th at 3 o'clock, to be oh, exact. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but who's, but <laughs> but who's, who's counting? counting? <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well. This is when I walked out of the restaurant, when, it, when, when I heard, I thought, you know, the sky looks different when you're a Pulitzer Prize winner. Everything uh, just seems crisper and better. Ah, uh -huh. well, it's just bound to be. Yeah. You're right. And miraculously, so to speak, mm -hmm. it's your first published book. Mm -hmm. So you're one for one. One for one, but if you, if you look at it, it took 19 years, mm -hmm. and, and the original manuscript was 3,400 pages, so I could have written seven, 500 page books during that period of time. So that would, that's probably more, more how you should look at it. I had a lot of practice by the time it came out. I know that you've been a practicing journalist, uh, feature writer, newspaper person, mm -hmm. but in, in a sense of, or in a, in a short way. How, how have you been earning a living through the 19 years that you were also writing Carry Me Home? Well, I had a, I had a generous husband. So that was, that was how I didn't, I didn't really earn a living. In fact, I was trying to calculate, how can you make negative money per hour? I mean, I made probably, you know, minus $4 an hour working on this. But you were a writer. Uh-huh. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I did, I did some freelancing, but I, I mostly worked on the book. And then I had two children in halfway through the process, or less than halfway through. So that slowed me down a lot. And you're a brookie. Uh, uh, a mountain brook girl. <laughs> yeah, sort of. I just said, though, the, you know, technically we did not live in Mountain Brook because my father was getting away from all of that. Mm -hmm. But yes, I was very much of the place. And, and as some people know, or readers of the book now know, mm -hmm. but others may not, um, you were a little girl mm -hmm. in the early middle 60s when the great demonstrations in Bull Connor and the excitement and the fire hoses and the dogs and the explosions were all going on mm -hmm. and uh, much later decided that you, this was an area you wanted to explore. Why? Why did you decide to devote yourself to this project? Well part of it was to try to understand how I could have lived through this turning point in American history because it really was what led, it was the climax of the Civil Rights Movement, I argue in the book. It led to the abolition of segregation in America. So. I had the privilege of living through that, that, and it was it had made no imprint on my consciousness, um, consciously anyway. It was, it was obviously buried, and it's interesting because a lot of the people I know who grew up during this period were really affected by it, indirectly if not directly. And um, what put me on the course of writing about it was I was reading a history of Alabama by Virginia Hamilton, who's this excellent Alabama historian, and um, I was living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I had put Alabama behind me. I thought I would never come back here, and I thought the events of the 60s had nothing to do with me. And I was reading this account of the demonstrations, and it was talking about a um, business, one of the prominent businessmen in town was the only white man would, who would allow his name to be used in the negotiations with Martin Luther King because it was so controversial. They wanted to do it secretly. They wanted to stop the demonstrations, but they didn't, nobody wanted to go on record as saying, okay, I, I said that, we, that they could sit at the lunch counters. So. This man was, had stood up in a meeting and said, I'm a segregationist, but I'm not a damn fool. And his name was Sidney Smyer. And I screamed to my empty apartment in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that's my cousin. So that was the first time I realized that this story had any bearing on my life. And um, his grandson, who was also his namesake, had been a classmate of mine at this very small private school in Birmingham. And we would always say to each other, um, I could call each other cousin, and you know everybody wanted to be kin to each other, mm -hmm. and everybody was related through Adam and Eve. So you know you, you really wanted to claim anybody you could. In Alabama, closer than that. Yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, he was not a kissing. He was, I guess, a kissing cousin. He was not a. It was hard to to figure out what the, what the exact bloodlines were. So, but um, he, Sid Meyer, had come from Ch the small town in Cherokee County where my grandfather had come from. So there was this this geographical kinship as well, and that was that was the first time. I thought, let me go look at this, or let me see what other tendrils I find going back 
um, to that story. And one of them, a little mystery, a little mm -hmm. familial tendril, was what part your father did or did not have in all of this. That's right. Uh, he, Papa was the, to, to say, the, to put it mildly, the black sheep of his family. He had grown up in this um, family of um, Ivy League educated country clubbers. His, his father had gone to Harvard Law School. His mother, my grandmother, had gone to Wellesley where I went and she was a college professor when I was growing up. And my father um, was just this kind of str strange renegade who hung out in beer joints and um, mm -hmm. had a, he had a, a shop. He made uh, rebuilt air compressors. And um, he would go out at night and say that he was at civil rights meetings. And he, and we, we said, Mama, you know, where's Papa? Oh, he's at one of the civil rights meetings. And of course, we un it was understood that that meant he was trying to stop the civil rights movement. So I grew up wondering what, what he'd been doing those nights and fearful that he had been do doing something possibly illegal and certainly not right. And I really wanted to find out. So that was one of the reasons I, I did this. Well. Let's, yes. let's end the suspense. <laughs> no, you have to read the book if you want to find out. Oh, I've read the book. <laughs> but, but for those people who yeah. won't, um, the news was basically neutral to good. The news was better than I feared, for sure. He had told me uh, that he knew the people who bombed the church. Um, and it turned out, and so once I got the list of this claver and this Klan club, mm -hmm that had fielded the church bombers, I, I went down the list and, and he didn't know any of them. And I, I don't know exactly why he, he would claim credit for something like that, but I think he, he really saw himself as, as this sort of mythic literary character. And lo and behold, that's what he becomes in my book. I, in a way, I fulfilled his, his um, dream. Well, good. <laughs> I, Perhaps I, not in the way yeah. he, you know, I, he would have preferred. When I did, you know, it's not a, it's not a mystery novel exactly, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but there is that strand in it of, of how is this, how is this exploration of your father's part going to come out? And when I got to the end, I thought, well, that's good. That's good. That's good, good. for Diane. And you know yes. what I thought? What? I thought I wonder what you would have written if it had turned out differently. If you had discovered something that you were. Um, uh -huh. Shocked by or horrified by? Yeah. I, of course, that didn't happen, but I, I, it's yeah. an interesting problem I for wonder, you as you went along, isn't it? Yeah, and, and I also wonder whether I would have been able to write a book if if I did have that such a painful secret. Um, I don't know. I, I, people have asked me that, and mm -hmm. I and I thought uh, they said, "Would you like? Would you turn him over to the authorities <laughs> or something?" And I said, "No, I don't think so. I think I would write about it, though. I don't think I could have stopped myself." Right. I. I thought I knew a lot about the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. but of course no one had taken me through it hour by hour before. Is that a criticism? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's a, I think, fair enough. And, and, and I did learn a lot, and mm -hmm. I want to go back to that. But before we talk about the 60s, I, I, for me, mm -hmm. um, the, um, the most valuable part of the book, mm -hmm. and, and for me the most interesting part, was perhaps Birmingham, the, the story of Birmingham in the 1930s, mm -hmm. in the 20s, with convict labor, and mm -hmm. the way that you, that you suggest that the foundations of the Birmingham of the 60s are laid in a much earlier Birmingham, maybe even the 1860s. Mm -hmm. How, when you explain that to people, that mm -hmm. this earlier Birmingham is the setting and the, mm -hmm. and the creation of the second one, how do you explain that? Well, first of all, that has been... I have gone on all these radio talk shows and everything. That is the the one thing everybody wants to talk about is the New Deal because everybody is so shocked by that and so interested. Most civil rights stories begin with Brown versus the Board in right. 1954 because right. that was kind of the the beginning of the modern civil rights movement, and then the Montgomery bus boycott two years later. But what I found was that the reason Birmingham is so interesting and, and, and it provides such a window onto America as well as the South is that it was the industrial capital of the Deep South. And because of that you had a lot, a bigger variety of um, forces in conflict than you did say in the agrarian areas um, in, in the old cotton, cotton industry which was fading by then. So, you, so what I discovered was that, it, that the conflict and race became 
the focus of it, but the conflict could really boil down to one thing, which was the industrialists wanted to stop organized labor. They did not want their workers to organize and gain any kind of self-determination in the marketplace, in the workplace. Leading up to that, the, um, and I know this sounds kind of flippant, but the workers had really been treated almost as an extension of the, of the employer's property rights, that they could, they could treat them however they mm -hmm. wanted. So it took a while for me to understand like, why, why the, the advent of organized labor in the 1930s was such an affront to them. But what happened was Franklin Roosevelt passed um, legislation that decreed for the first time that workers had the legal right backed by the, the authority of the federal, federal government to organize into, into labor unions. So this created this huge backlash on the part of the business establishment, not just in the South, but in the country. In the South, the, the best way for them to disrupt labor was to divide the, the black and white workforce. And the best way to do that was to foment racial strife be to, to, to between them. So, um, so that was, you know, so I discovered that the steel companies in the 30s had vigilantes on their payroll mm -hmm. to beat up labor organizers saying that they had been um, promoting social equality between the races because they were trying to organize them into the, into the same unions. They subsidized uh, propagandists who published leaflets, pamphlets that painted the labor union as um, an internationalist conspiracy run by communist Jews and their Negro, with their Negro dupes. That was kind of the, the, the essence of it. So one and, long word. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and um, anyway, so, so that then kind of morphed, that, that anti-union resistance morphed into the segregationist resistance. And the great thing about Birmingham was that it wasn't just that the tradition continued, it was the same characters. Bull Connor had been in put into City Hall, elected to City Hall in, the, in 1937 as an anti-New Deal mascot. Because what happened was that the business leaders who had put him up, basically, weren't, they needed somebody who could appeal to the average person. Now, the, the New Deal programs were designed to uplift the average person, the grassroots, the poor people, but they needed somebody who could turn them against those policies. And Bull Connor was the man chosen to do that. And then, of course, he became the cartoon villain of the civil rights era, sicking the dogs and fire hoses on the child demonstrators in 1963. Where would the movement have been without him? That's what Kennedy said. That's what <laughs> Kennedy said to a, a, a group of uh, movement leaders, including uh, Dr. King. He said, I wouldn't be too hard on Bull Connor. He's done more for civil rights than almost anybody. Besides Bull Connor, mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that there are other villains. Who, who in that 10-year stretch should we be angry at? Who, who are the people who worked the hardest and the meanest <laughs> to, to keep progress from, from coming to Birmingham. Well, interestingly, when I was growing up, um, we thought Bull Connor was just this redneck buffoon and had nothing to do with, with the polite people, and he was always embarrassing us. And um, come to find out that his so-called handler was one of the most prominent men in Birmingham. And his grandson also went to school with me in my small little private school. And his name was Jim Simpson, James A. Simpson. He had been a state senator, a very powerful state senator in the 30s, and had sort of spearheaded the anti-New Deal resistance in the state of Alabama. Um, he, had, he was pretty much the one who um, gave, called the cut shots for Bull Connor. He would, what their, their, the system was that they would turn more and more power over to the police and give, for example, write the bus laws so that the police had the discretion to enforce them. The same with the housing laws. Once they were trying to get around the discrimination, they, they would take racial language out of the statutes to get around discrimination and then turn power over to the police to preserve the peace. So um, I remember thinking, oh, that's what a police state is. I had never really, you know, that could have been just sort of a cliche um, and something that I never really examined how it worked, but I thought, oh, that's what it is. You, this, the police has authority to, to you know, total discretion to enforce the law. So they became, in a sense, the, the agents or the tools of, of the, the big mules who wanted things to basically stay the same. Mm -hmm. Peace in the Valley at that point meant, you know, rigid segregation. They, you know, they, they wanted to, to keep the labor force divided, as I said, to keep wages low, to keep them fighting with each other, and also to, to um, distance them from the national 
union leadership, which was which was generally more liberal than certainly than the rank and file in Alabama. So that was th that was the two pronged strategy. And who should we admire more than we do? Who are the, in a sense, the secret heroes? And having, when a person reads through Carry Me Home, mm -hmm. where are the surprises where you say, oh, I knew about Reverend King, but I didn't know about these people. Who, mm -hmm. are, the, who are the heroes that, that you bring to, to the surface that maybe hadn't gotten much attention before? Well, the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth is, is a good example because he had been, even though he is a, um, I wouldn't say prominent, but he's certainly present in other movement histories. He's generally he was generally treated as this sort of freak show, uh, this guy who was always courting death, which he was, and extremely autocratic, um, and kind of a sort of a showman who didn't really have organizational skills and was just off, you know, calling attention to himself. And even sympathetic accounts of him have treated him as fairly marginal. Um, what, I, what I realized, though, was that, um, so for example, people would say, well, his, he didn't have that many followers, followers in Birmingham compared to the black population, the size of the black population. So what I realized, though, was that he was the only minister at the, in the, at the top level of S, or in SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was the organization that he and King founded in 1957. Shuttlesworth was the only leader who had who sustained a mass movement over all these years. Uh, Montgomery had one during the bus boycott, but then that that faded. Um, so it wasn't so so instead of looking at it as oh well he didn't have that many followers, six hundred maybe out of I don't know what the black population was, but thousands. Um, he didn't have that many. It was like he did something nobody else did. The other thing was that he there were really three top leaders in SELC, King Shuttlesworth and Ralph Abernathy, who was King's best friend. Rabber, Abernathy was really a, a rubber stamp for King. So then when you look at it that way, it was really Shuttlesworth and King were the two major forces in this church-based, preacher-led civil rights movement. And Shuttlesworth was very confrontational. He wasn't that interested in dealing with white people. He was interested in, organize, in organizing black people to stand up to segregation. King, one of his gifts, one of his many gifts was to be able to speak to white people, um, to, to convey the plight of his people to the white public that was going to be, you know, needed, w w that presidents would need to enlist their opinion in order to get legislation passed. So he was brilliant at that. You really needed the two of them. You needed Shuttlesworth's impulse to confront. He, it was just, it, he, it was almost a compulsion on his part, but you also needed King's gift for reconciliation or it wouldn't have happened. I, I thought, uh, and maybe I read, read this a little harder than you meant it, Yes. that King had s uh, aided Shuttlesworth out of the spotlight as events in Birmingham uh, were drawing to a close, that he sort of pushed uh, the Reverend Shuttlesworth off to the side. He did, and it was the whole so the the whole Atlanta bunch of this, mm -hmm. I, I've set up a sort of conflict yeah. between scruffy old Birmingham and elegant <laughs> Atlanta yeah. um, during the demonstrations. At first, it had been Shuttlesworth show. He brought King in, and then gradually the spotlight shifted to King, as should be expected. But at the end, there was a very um, the big controversy at the end where the demonstrations had they'd finally succeeded in filling the jails, which was the Gandhian mandate for nonviolent strategy and had never been achieved in this country before. So they had turned out the school children into the streets of Birmingham, filled the jails. Things were getting kind of hot. They turned the dogs and hoses on them. Um, people were getting upset. Uh, black people were losing their fear of the police perhaps too quickly and the movement was concerned right. that they, there might be an incident and that um, dog bites were fine, but if, if a child was seriously injured or killed, God forbid, then the movement would, was going to get as much blame as the white people. They just knew that was going to happen. So, um, so they called off the demonstrations, and this was while Shuttlesworth had, was in the hospital because he had been knocked unconscious by fire, a fire hose s spray. So um, he, got a, he rallied, he, he fought off, Two, three hypodermic sedatives, and and came back and confronted King and said, "Who is calling out the demonstrations? You don't call out the demonstrations without me." And he basically called them back on again. Now they, he, they finessed it by calling it a moratorium, 
But Shuttlesworth was keenly aware that, that King had this reputation for going into communities after a protest had been, had been right. launched, getting a lot of attention, a lot of publicity, and then leaving the community without any really hard um, victories having, having been yeah. won. So yeah. he didn't want that to happen in Birmingham. Shuttlesworth was afraid of the Albany, Georgia. Exactly. Example. Exactly. That that had been a real embarrassment for SELC. SNCC, the Southern, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had started that campaign. SELC had come in, help quote help them out. King had gone to jail, mm -hmm. but then then gotten out, and uh, so they had a lot. They had that to overcome, right. and Birmingham was going to be their redemption. And it, in fact, it was. It turned out. Mm -hmm. I, um, you know, this is not a situation where we're where we're going to criticize people harshly, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but I was interested as I moved along in, the, in several groups of people who really just weren't as brave or helpful as they should have been. Uh -huh. And I'm interested in, uh, l let me name who I have in yeah. mind. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, black businessmen like Gaston, mm -hmm. the, the storekeeper, the owners of the department stores mm -hmm. in downtown Birmingham, mm -hmm. and the Black Preacher Brotherhood in general, as it spread around Birmingham and Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. um, if I just said outright that those those people were dragging their feet, mm -hmm. those people were not. Those people weren't in the movement the way they should have been. Is, mm -hmm. Can you respond to them, uh, the three different groups, and maybe others that you would, mm -hmm. you would think of? Because I think that's the impression that that I got well, coming what, away from the book. Yeah, oh, that, no, that's definitely true. And one of the the things that writing about such a class stratified place as Birmingham enabled me to do was sort of put a, the lens of social class on everything and that was very much true in the black community. There was a huge division between the black middle class, the black professional class and the so-called masses. Shuttlesworth was a man of the masses and he organized the masses. The so-called classes were hostile to the civil rights movement. Um, they were they had, I mean, you have to be sympathetic to, certainly because they had had strived to achieve. The black middle class. Yeah, and they had, yeah. they were prospering within in the system. They had a lot to lose. They did not want to gamble on a loser. So that is why they had never signed on with Shuttlesworth really strongly. Mm -hmm. Occasionally they would put up money for stuff, um, for court cases or something. But um, it was really only when King came to town and had and pretty much guaranteed a victory that they got on board mm -hmm. the movement. So, and there was always, and there was a class division between um, King and Shuttlesworth as well. I mean, he was, oh. King was the Hamlet, Kim. Hamlet of the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. and, and Shuttlesworth was sort of this blunt instrument. And he called himself the, a, the, a cussing preacher. Well, after, <laughs> after Shuttlesworth was blown up yeah. and didn't even get hurt mm -hmm. when his house was dynamited, he really must have thought that he, that he was, it, um, immortal. He did. He thought he was he was anointed by God. And mm -hmm. before that, he had been afraid to take airplanes. And then after that, he he said, "I literally tried to get myself killed." And you can imagine why a lot of people wouldn't want to follow him. Um, <laughs> Somebody who thinks he can't be killed. Yes, and yeah. uh, and there and a lot of there's a lot of uh, jealousy and infighting among the among the black ministers in town. And uh, the so-called big preachers looked down on the on the little preachers. And Shuttlesworth wasn't a little preacher, but he he didn't his congregation. Uh, didn't have the standing that, say, the 16th Street Baptist Church did, ironically, which was the snootiest church in town, and had actually been fairly unfriendly to the civil rights movement. The, the minister had to um, really convince his congregation to let the movement use their sanctuary to stage the demonstrations because they were centrally located right next to the, the park right. where, they, where they marched. That turns out to be a horrible irony, that horrible a church that, that was so slow to get into the movement actively mm -hmm turns out to be the church that's bombed, that's and, bombed and the little girls are killed. An interesting dynamic took place after the bombing. Everybody wanted to find a reason that those girls had been killed. So they, they, the fact mm -hmm. that their parents had not let them march, most of the school children marched, the, somehow certified them as innocent, as if, uh -huh. if they had have marched, then at least they, would have, they had done something to, just, to invite this. Um, but you know, it, and these were commentators of all stripes pointed this out. They were totally innocent. They hadn't done anything. Yeah. I know for the next while you're going to be busy 12 hours a day signing your book. <laughs> <laughs> it's more fun than writing it. <laughs> yes, but when you do, uh -huh. when the dust settles and calm returns and you're back at your desk, uh -huh. um, what, what should we be looking for from you next? 
Well, I have a couple of things I'm thinking about, and neither of them has to do with the Civil Rights Movement. So I, my, my motto is um, maximum work for minimum pay, so I'm going try to, <laughs> to try to go and you know, have to get my, my PhD, my 10-year PhD in some other field. No, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping this won't take, the next one won't take me 19 years. At least I, at least I know that it can be done this time. Well, what is it? Oh, I can't say yet. Not at all? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure yet. Okay. Um, it's still, still on the drawing board. Well, you're not done with this one, or at least America's not done with this one. There, there'll be a lot of, of uh, readings and signings and interviews in the future. I hope so. But I'm glad we had a chance to get this one. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.